The genius of an artist is more than their music. It's their character, personality, beliefs, and most importantly, story. Before I begin, I want to say thank you to all the people who took the time out of their day to watch this series. A month and a half ago, this was my subscriber count, and now, I'm monetized. It really goes to show how far you can get when you're truly dedicated to something you're passionate about. So again, thank each and every one of you who took the time to watch my videos, and welcome if you're new to the channel. Much love, and let's begin. The undeniable success of Frank Ocean is without a doubt one of many unique cases I've seen in the music industry. The 33-year-old's artistry has been compared to that of James Taylor, Al Green, Stevie Wonder, and Marvin Gaye, winning two Grammys and nominated seven times for his work going number one on Billboard. His experimental approach validated the ears of listeners, becoming a representative of transforming alternative R&B. But the commercial domain of this artist's career is intentional, given it notably lacks when paired to counterparts who featured him. Nevertheless, his presence is highly anticipated when your favorite artist releases a project, and that's because Frank Ocean brings more to the table than cookie-cutter hit singles. Today, I'll be going over the story of Frank Ocean, breaking down almost every layer of his life that led us to love him, and why he's one of many leaders in the hip-hop world. He sacrifices notoriety for the art form, that's his discography, and many fail to resonate with his style the first time around. Despite his music, Frank has been underestimated, often overcoming the trials and tribulations that's his life. But how? Frank Ocean is known to stay away from the spotlight with only a handful of interviews and little to no videos of himself on the internet. He believes he should be known through his craft, keeping his personal life out of the media. I won't be diving into his lyrics given I feel they're meant for self-interpretation by the listener, but before exploring the mind of this blonded man, we need to visit the importance of his childhood prior to calling himself Frank Ocean. Christopher Edwin Bro, brother of two, was born on October 28, 1987 in Long Beach, California. At five years old, his family moved to the low-income area of New Orleans. The Louisiana city has been stuck in time, heavily propagated by African, Spanish, and French culture, giving young Christopher a vast amount of history to learn from. At the young age of six, his father left the family without explanation. This confused and hurt Christopher, however, his grandfather Lionel raised him playing the father figure every child desperately needed. He lived with his mother Catania, who warm-heartedly named him Lonnie, since he was close to Lionel during this time. At the age of nine, Lionel introduced Lonnie to magazines that showcased an expensive luxury vehicles, beginning an intense love for classic rides and unaffordable supercars. Fascinated with the lifestyle of a millionaire, he put his head in the hustle by mowing lawns, walking dogs, and completing other various small jobs for profit. When Christopher wasn't in school, he'd interpret life alone on the rooftops of New Orleans. He listened to generations of artists before his time, overseeing the ultraviolet sunsets elapsing the horizon of hot summer nights. Artists like Donna Summer, Jimi Hendrix, and The Beatles heavily influenced his philosophy on life during his teen years and wrote his own lyrics ever since. At 16, he scraped up whatever hustle money he could muster to buy studio time. His newly found passion for writing and recording overcame his mother's personal opinions about his hobbies, but even with his education goal set in place, was destined to make a career in the music industry. When younger, he got kicked out of private school for fighting, but ill regardless was thankful for being in public school so he could disappear. At 17, he graduated John Ert High School, and in fall of that year, attended the University of New Orleans to major in English. But as fate had it, Hurricane Katrina wiped out the city, along with his home and studio, having to relocate in Texas with family for a while. After being transferred to the University of Louisiana, two and a half hours from New Orleans, the move didn't last long when he was offered a deal in studio time in his birth town of California. The now 18-year-old Christopher dropped out and moved back for the first time in over a decade. With only $11,000 in cash, he left Louisiana and became employed to support the life he pursued. Studio time was crucial for his future and would often put that before himself, including a major change in his identity. By 2006, Christopher knew he wanted to change his name. Taking inspiration from the 1960s movie Ocean's Eleven, Frank Sinatra's character Danny Ocean was his favorite lead role, but even encapsulating the memories of his youth through music and movies wouldn't be enough to bring him fame and fortune. Unknown to most, he was on track to revolutionizing R&B, becoming a musical conduit for the heartfelt youth through nostalgic and universally crafted masterpieces made by the man who will soon call himself Frank Ocean. Be the boyfriend 
early days of being an artist, he pondered the idea of changing his name legally, but the regard for such matter came to a halt to support himself financially. The now 19-year-old self-titled Frank Ocean discovered how to get his foot in the door by making appearances and surrounding himself with artists in his niche. Frank realized these were starving artists as well, creating a barrier between his initial mindset and the drive he needed for being competitive. One night at a listening party, several artists put their laptops on a table, playing demoed songs through their speakers. This was the opportunity to demo some of what he had prepared, and although nervous, did it. As luck had it, several producers in the room heard his potential, inviting him to the studio later that week. Frank used his ability to sing and write, whilst the producers engineered the roadwork for instrumentals that'll soon to be revolutionized by the man himself. The demos Frank recorded were submitted through people who had connections that'd be received and copied by a variety of mainstream artists. He flourished in the opportunity to ghostwrite for artists by the likes of John Legend, Brandy, and JB, garnering an immense amount of cash estimated to be around a few hundred thousand. However, the newly found fortune Frank found himself flourishing in wasn't what it seemed. After all, he had what he always wanted. An expensive BMW, an apartment in Beverly Hills, all the women he can dream of, and several mainstream hits with Lonnie Bro as the name in the credits. He was grateful of his accomplishments, but felt miserable. He soon realized his happiness stemmed around the lack of people who appreciated his work, nor a label in favor of growing his name, but this wasn't the only conflicting thing that irked him. His girlfriend at the time had no idea of the unofficial relationship between him and another man. The revelation of having feelings for the same sex at the young age of 19 may have led him to isolation. Whichever the case, living a lie did. Everything seemed like a dream partaking until another catastrophe was destined to wipe it away. But as fate had it, this was just the beginning. The beginning of his true destination. Fame. Frank still has never released a song of his own, barely making a name for himself or ever gaining the notoriety from a big name label. But this soon changed when an industry producer by the nickname Tricky put him on game when he was 22. Tricky was the producer behind hits for Rihanna's Umbrella and Beyonce's Single Ladies, giving him enough credit to recommend Frank to a record label. Ironically enough, this was the same record label Frank had written hits for. In late 2009, Frank signed to Def Jam for a two album deal as a solo artist. This was a good thing, right? By 2011, Frank had been signed for almost two years without releasing a single or project. He felt this was his time to show the world who he is, who he can and will be. In the months leading up to his first project release, he worked with various producers to create the masterpiece that's Nostalgia Ultra. Pulling from his love for expensive vehicles, the cover of his first mixtape displays an orange BMW E30 M3 that acts as a visual tone setter for what's to come. The track list consists of mellow pop that some consider to be experimental or lo-fi. The general vibe of each track takes you back with stories of love and drugs, exaggerated on quality instrumentals. With hit songs like Novocaine and Swim Good, Nostalgia Ultra means exactly that. Samples used from Coldplay, The Eagles, MGMT, and Radiohead were all chopped together to complete Frank's vision for his debut project. But of course, nothing could be perfect after finding out Def Jam wouldn't clear the samples. They didn't even try reaching out to the bands, undoubtedly pissing Frank off. Ill regardless of circumstance, Frank needed to put this project out, and although he couldn't profit off his streams due to these legal reasons, he took it to Tumblr releasing it for free on February 16th, 2011. Nostalgia Ultra received an unprecedented applause, and finally, a fan base. I was in the car, and my husband was playing uh, this, this music, and this guy's tone and his lyrics just touched me. And after one song, I said, okay, who is that? <laughs> because I want them on a flight tonight. The early 2010s birthed a new form of promotion via the internet. Although the internet existed, it was uncommon for artists to expand their reach on social media platforms, given most of them were in early development at the time. What can we expect yeah. next from Frank Ocean? Uh, shit, I don't I, know. I you kind of just like, gotta wait and see. You're already uh, nine or ten pieces into another project. That's what, I'm, that's what I read. I think yeah, that's like. coming along good. That's coming along really good. But there might be some new shit coming out before then. Luckily, Frank was at the forefront of the new era, capitalizing off of the opportunity at hand. During the same year of Nostalgia Ultra's release, Beyonce picked up on the artist quickly after hearing his hits Novocaine and Swim Good, including his credibility in the industry as a writer. And he told me it was Frank Ocean, and I immediately reached out, and he came in the next day, and we did like five or six songs. Really, really talented, very fast. He just has so many ideas, and um, 
It's great because he's an artist and I can't wait for everyone to hear him because he's just the truth. With Frank Ocean's experience at ghostwriting for mainstream artists, Beyonce created five songs with the man and got featured on Jay-Z and Kanye's Watch the Throne. He was finally famous and decided now was the time to change his name from Lonnie Bro to Frank Ocean at 23 years old. He is just so humble, such a nice person. Say, what the what what the fuck did you just say? I, said it. I was real calm and shit, but I'll fuck you up right now. What did you just say to me? What you, what the fuck you got to say to me, man? He thinks he's Moesha when he's home alone. You think you the brat when you not at home. You you ate out JD. Oh. You ate out Missy, no challenge. You fucked all the members from Jagged Edge before the Where the Party At single. You fucked 98 Degrees while Britney Spears watched, no challenge. You let <laughs> they finger you. You let Jimmy Fallon do you. You let Tavis Smiley suck your gooch. You let Tyler Perry cash you in his next movie. You braided AJ from 106 in Park's hair. You faded Lil Zane's. <laughs> if you're for some reason not familiar with who this is Hi YouTubes, it's me Jefferson I'm here to tell you about the dangers of herpes If you're out getting f***ed in the ass of this f***ing dick At least let some of us know You know why? Because I don't want herpes Neither do my cats oh, good girl. Ah! And smoking weed every day And not having a job Figure four leg lock you mother your girlfriend look like my mom. I stay with you for most of your life until you're about 45 and uh, some thing called menopause. Uh, I just disappear. I'll, re I'll, I'll stop resisting. Are you still enjoying it? Happy birthday, bitch. Tyler, the creator, is the ringleader of a small group of individuals who call themselves out future. Consider them to be the black version of Jackass. But before they had a show on Adult Swim, Tyler featured Frank in 2011's Goblin, given they were friends years prior to fame. Frank was a part of Odd Future for a time, but parted ways given their goals and aspirations didn't line up with those of the group. Here's your sandwich. Oh, oh, thank you, mister. You such a... Wait, what the f***? Hey, 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 turn the music off. What's wrong? Why the f*** is it peaches on my sandwich? Why is I don't, it... Y'all this nigga put peaches on my hey, sandwich. Hey, I'm allergic hey, to hey, peanut butter. Answer a question. Hey, hey answer what, me what, one question. You asked for a peanut butter sandwich. Hey, that's uh, extra peaches on the bread. Yo, he called you a liar, young uh, nigga. Oh, I ain't even seen. Hey, no, hey, I, I did write that. It's you know, I got, you got, no, I got pneumonia. I'll be forgetting shit. Oh, okay, well played, well played. Okay, well, well, well you sit here and think about what you did, and we gonna take a piss break. Oh, you all fat. You better be here. On sit, on sit down. Bitch. Take a seat. Wait, take the seat. What? Sit, oh, no. The chair, nigga. Right, cool. Everybody cool. out. The chair, nigga. Right, the chair, on, nigga. Come on, y'all. Even though Tyler threatened his life for making him a peach sandwich, he forgave him and stayed close friends from here on out. So close, in fact, Tyler knew of Frank's secret. The secret that had been a major conflict for Frank since he was 19. The relationship he had with another man. Frank Ocean is guaranteed a spot in becoming the next big pop star aside Ariana Grande and The Weeknd. With the breakout success of Frank Ocean, Def Jam decided to cooperate with him from here on out, giving the support Frank needed for his first studio album, Channel Orange. The 2012 project was one of two album releases in his contract, and with the full backing of his label finally giving him the resources he needed, samples were cleared for the first time in his career. The album was a noble follow-up to Nostalgia Ultra, but this time going all out experimental. Some consider this genre to be pop or neo-soul, with the sounds of organs, tape decks, car doors, waves, and white noise displaying the general vibe of the album. This made it a hit and transformed the industry from within the confines of his talent. But before the release of Channel Orange, there was one important thing he needed to do to feel true to his fans, and most importantly, himself. On July 4th, 2012, Frank released a come out letter to the world, a poetic essay documenting the experiences from 19 to 24, finally getting to show the world who he is as an individual. Some believe this was a stunt to promote his album, but the way he came out felt sincere and failed to leave bad taste in people's mouths. You know, my take on Frank Ocean, I feel like he's a hero 
in my eyes, you know. As a black gay man in the artist field, you can't just come out to everyone and just admit that you're gay and still expect people to have your back or to respect you as an artist. So in my eyes, he's a hero for doing that. In January of 2013, a fight between Frank Ocean and Chris Brown transpired following a parking space at a studio they went to. Notably, Chris Brown was still on probation for the physical altercation with fellow pop star Rihanna. However, Chris Brown was set on beefing with artists the likes of Tyler the Creator, leading to Frank getting tied in and Tyler doing what he does best, trolling. He beats up women, he's a bitch. But the now admitted Frank Ocean decided to stand his ground when confronted by Chris, leading to him and his team jumping Frank. According to Sean Kingston, Frank and his crew of Crips instigated the fight, but regardless of what the suicidal singer says, the situation didn't help Chris given his history of anger issues toward fellow celebrities. With the unlikely reality that Frank Ocean is gang affiliated with the opposing gang Chris is in, is almost hilarious and makes Sean Kingston seem like a paid alibi for the abusive pop star who may have given him the chip. It also didn't help Chris that Frank was the only one who spoke to the cops, and if Frank was street, snitching wouldn't favor his credibility, despite being a world-renowned pop star. But as media ensues, they jumped on the topic of what Chris called Frank during the studio brawl. Cops reported that Chris shouted a homophobic slur to Frank while getting pinned by his goons. Within a year of Frank coming out was the immediate reaction from Chris when beating him up, and to this day is still being held accountable for his words and actions, inevitably regretting the incident ever happening. Well, with the Frank Ocean situation, I, I just put it like this. It's in the past. Mm -hmm. You know, um, stuff went down, but it, it's, it's, it's whatever. It's, it's always sensationalized and always blown out of proportion. You know, I got respect for his music. I res got respect for everybody else. So, you know, I ain't really trying to, you know, go back down that route. Everything for me is moving forward. I, I got, that. I got, I, I do my music now, so I'm good. Right. Well, hell, you was at a Yo. studio doing music yeah. then. Yeah, you know. But, you know? But, Happens right, right. <laughs> Man, shit does happen. Right? <laughs> That's the best it just seems like a lot of shit happens to you. I woke up Chris Breezy. Despite celebrity beefs and physical altercations, Frank had bigger problems on his hands. Def Jam was taking a massive percentage from Channel Orange's streaming numbers. His net worth was disgustingly smaller than his gross, and it didn't help that he was being sued by his father around this time as well. Those from a record label who neglect the potential of their artists is where the phrase, sold my soul, comes from in this industry. And by not getting the full support of Def Jam from day one, left him with a pessimistic stance on the industry as a whole. Frank realized he messed up after signing a two album deal as a solo artist because he wasn't a solo artist. He had no fans to make songs for because he wrote songs for other people. He wasn't an industry plant who was bred all his life to become number one. He wasn't an addict who had the appeal of a deceased pop star. And he wasn't a rapper who used autotune to his advantage. Def Jam only wanted him for the appeal of his writing skills and knew what they were giving him when handing over the contract. At first glance, it's an artist's dream come true, when in retrospect, was a legal obligation to be a slave to it. His first album, Nostalgia Ultra, didn't count as an album in his deal because it had copyrighted samples. Samples, Def Jam never cleared because they didn't want him to fulfill his contract. And why would they when they had the likes of a young boy who made them millions and could be easily manipulated during this time? This is how Def Jam trapped him, and he was just starting to fathom the bigger picture this evil corporation set him up in. Despite Nostalgia Ultra's success, Frank Ocean wouldn't be recognized if he wasn't picked up from the likes of Beyonce, Jay-Z, and Kanye. His label would have never given him the green light to drop Channel Orange a year after making it, one of two albums in the deal. By 2014, Frank realized he needed to play Def Jam's game in order to unf himself from his contract. He managed to make it this far, he may as well fulfill it and reap the benefits too. He needed one more album to complete to be out of the deal for good, so he came up with a master plan to execute it. In August of 2016 began the rollout for his second studio album, Endless, the final release to fulfill his contract and get out of Def Jam's grasp. However, something was different about this one. Frank signed an exclusive album deal with Apple that still remains in the legal limits of his Def Jam contracts, but Endless wasn't pieced together like a traditional track-by-track -track album would be. Instead, it was showcased via live stream that lasted over five days, which was only accessible on Apple Music. The live stream consisted of Frank building a staircase in a Brooklyn warehouse, while snippets of Endless played in the background. Fans were hyped and Def Jam was confused, but once the live stream ended they realized they were just trolled. 
Taken straight out of Tyler's book, Endless ended up becoming what felt like an endless wait for an endless live stream that led to a 45 minute visual album titled Endless. All to get out of the deal he says has been a chess game for 7 years. He purposefully made his final album a waste of time to lower first week sales that estimated to be a small $157,000. In other words, instead of making Def Jam millions, he gave them exactly what they saw in him, little to nothing. But the finessing wasn't over just yet when Frank finally escaped Def Jam's grasp and dropped a magazine titled Boys Don't Cry a day later. The magazine was inspired by the ones he'd read as a kid and featured body art, cars, and other various things Frank Ocean loves, including a poem about McDonald's written by Kanye West. But as confusing as was intentional, did everyone realize the purpose of this self-sabotage was for? Def Jam believed Frank Ocean needed Def Jam, when in reality was the other way around. Without second guessing he would leave, did they see the real potential of this artist? On the day after Endless released was Frank's fourth album Blonde, which became the biggest industry finesse of the century. That's right, Endless and Boys Don't Cry was meant to build up hype for Blonde, which reportedly racked in 2 mil on top of the supposed 20 mil from the Apple deal. Things got so heated in fact, the head of Universal Music Group, aka the asshole who makes my videos non-profitable, came out and put a ban on these Apple deals. The loophole Frank found was closed, and the label claimed the relationship was like a bad marriage, taking down most of his music videos from YouTube. But regardless, Frank Ocean finally owned 100% of his masters, and freed himself from the grips of Def Jam. What do you want people to know uh, about you as an artist? That, um, I don't know if it's about me, but I think just creativity in general, um, you know, just doing what you want is so important. You know, doing what you feel is, is right and what connects with you is important. And I know that might be, you know, cliche trite corny sappy whatever you want to say but you know um one of the coolest things about what i'm experiencing right now as far as people responding to the songs i wrote and what i what i decided to do is that it really is me you know it's, it's so when people say they f with it it's like they f with me and that feels cool you know and um i mean everybody who's listening like and, and who listened and and you know I mean, it's just crazy, man. Like, you know, I'm, I, I, it's cool. Like, you know, and I, I want people to know that I'll continue doing that. No matter what the f they think I should make, I'll always make what I want to make. And what I feel is, is the tightest. Sh By this point, Frank Ocean saw himself as the man he dreamt of becoming as a youth. However, it wasn't what it seemed to be once he executed his master plan. Nevertheless, Def Jam did fail to see his potential, but they also played a major part in boosting his career as well. Throughout years of being stuck under a bad label and seeing firsthand what fame can do to a person was a realization. Fame is a heavy weight to carry, and once he gives up his private life for a spot in the mainstream world, will he then become exposed to the opinions of millions? But ill regardless of staying away from the public, he still revealed his sexuality, making it easier for the gay community to be accepted in this industry. Given he's worked alongside some of the biggest artists in the game, he's managed to secure a spot in being one of the few who can say they made the industry vulnerable after being finessed the way they did. Since then, more and more artists have come out to admit the truths of their label's contract in this industry. In 2013, Frank won a Grammy for Channel Orange, less than a month after Chris Brown's homophobic slur, making it a justified payback. After declining Blonde for 2016's Grammy nominations, Ocean was heavily criticized by them after saying the awards were out of touch with music by young black artists. Grammy's broadcast producer Ken Ehrlich and writer David Wilde replied by saying his 2013 performance was awkward and wasn't meant for television. But over the course of the decade, big name artists began boycotting the Grammys as well. Frank Ocean was finally out of the deal and claimed 100% of Blonde's revenue after it went number one on Billboard. With songs like Nike's, Pink and White, In My Room, and Ivy goes to show how much a label can be useful in boosting songs given these are sleeper hits. 
but Frank doesn't want nor need that. Most artists who become mainstream almost do a disservice to the OG fans, and in what feels like a betrayal. However, as many of you need to remember, the whole goal of being an artist is to have a bigger reach with your art. Luckily for Ocean, the fans have him all to themselves, and if you fail to resonate with his style the first time around, it's okay. His music isn't for everybody, and the fact that he embraces the ones who do love him shows that he doesn't care about notoriety or making cookie cutter hit singles. But despite not wanting to be in the limelight, chose to stay true to himself after being underestimated, making some of the most influential music of the 2010s, and overcame the trials and tribulations that certified him a bona fide genius. If you've enjoyed this content, consider subscribing and donating to my Patreon. Hit the bell below and follow me on Instagram and Twitter for frequent content updates. What's your favorite Frank Ocean project, and how did you discover him? Thank you for watching.